Welcome. This is Dr. Susan Kalb with Temple of Health Radio Show. And today I'm very pleased to have the um, producer of, I guess, and director of Brzezinski, the movie. This is a remarkable movie outlining the story of a cancer researcher and doctor who actively treats patients who is a developer of anti-neoplastins. Um, I have heard for years about the effectiveness of these treatments, especially in brain tumors and especially in untreatable childhood brain tumors of the, of the brain stem, and his results are no less uh, short of miraculous. However, uh, Eric tells the story of what happened to him in a country that will, um, in this country, which is a uh, remarkable story and one that we need to um, spread as far as we can so that we can get this, um, get this pattern and practice change and get some true cancer research going on in, in this country. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. Can you give our listeners a little bit of background on how you first learned of um, the problem that the doctor was having and how you made the decision to make this more public and and, uh, put together this movie? Sure. I come from a pretty mainstream uh, commercial background. I've worked on Madison Avenue for a long time in ad agencies, and um, I even worked on uh, campaigns for the pharmaceutical industry as well. And I've always just sort of been interested in television and film and uh, worked on TV shows and other movies, but never directed my own film before. And Mm -hmm. documentaries are something that I think are really important, especially uh, in this day and age. It's almost like the documentary filmmaker world is sort of picking up where the mainstream media is sort of uh, scared or won't uh, take the effort to go into. So it's almost Mm -hmm. like an extension of journalism, really. So. Basically, I read a book by a man named Ralph Moss who worked at the at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and he was the public relations director, and he uh, was fired because he uh, blew the whistle on a cover-up for another cancer treatment that was going on being studied there. They were mm-hmm. getting good results behind the scenes, and they and J- Ralph's job was to tell the world that they were getting bad results. So he, <laughs> right. blew, right, right. So he blew the whistle, and he got fired, and he got really right. interested in the subject, and he wrote a book yeah. called The Cancer Industry. And in that book, there's a chapter on Dr. Brzezinski. And what right. stuck out to me about Brzezinski was, unlike a lot of the other treatments out there um, that most people know about, they're usually so, sort of suppressed and, and ignored because of non-patentability. And mm-hmm. um, in this case, it's a little different. It's a, it's a genuine scientific discovery that Brzezinski had made, one that had never been discovered before. And he managed to learn how to synthesize this discovery and have patents on it. Mm-hmm. He's in FDA-approved clinical trials, and he's done it independently without the help of government funding or the help of the pharmaceutical industry itself. And so that just fascinated me. And, <clears throat> and then not on top of the fact that he is, uh, you know, uh, curing incurable cancer. So you combine the two. I just, I couldn't really sort of, um, you know, forget about that. So I just started mm-hmm. emailing and calling the clinic and, um, Essentially, it took like six months of back and forth with them, <laughs> and just to really gain their trust and um, their trust. Exactly. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure they've had a lot of uh, you know th- other instances where it was untrustworthy. So yeah, that was yeah. I'd just come off the tail end of uh, another journalist who came in with big open arms. He writes for the Houston Press and uh, was very friendly, and they gave him everything he needed to know. And of course, the article was just completely bashing him, and, and uh, mm-hmm. it was, sort of, was a big bad hatchet job. Right. So, right. You know, I had and that was like really a, like a month before I started calling them. So mm-hmm. Right, <laughs> it didn't, yeah. It didn't help. Well, th- these people are sending on purpose, as you know. Uh, sure. It's, it's it's not something that is uh, – there, there is there is two two kinds of media in this country, as, as I don't need to tell you, the fr- the true free media and the, and the media f- that represents the powers that be. Right. And, it, and it's very interesting. And I, I agree with you. Documentaries are absolutely crucial because none of these issues are simple. Um, you know, they're not uh, to understand what he has been through and what he's been doing takes a documentary. It's it's even difficult just to do that in an article. Sure. Yeah, it was hard to. I mean, I had to. There's a lot that happened that I was not able to fit in the film. The film was pretty yeah. lengthy, lengthy and intense as it is. Right. So, yeah. Well, let's go back and um, tell his story a little bit. I guess the story you tell in the documentary and. And um, uh, then we'll talk uh, more in large about 
um, why and how cancer therapies are suppressed. And it's not just in the U.S. It, it's actually worldwide. Mm-hmm. Um, doctor, you know, doctor like Dr. Hammer in, in, in Europe was jailed when, when he had a high a cure rate. Mm-hmm. And my understanding is that when people start curing cancer right and left, um, often government agencies show up and, and, and engage them in ways to keep them from publishing or widely disseminating the information. Right. So this is this is um you know pattern and practice type thing we can talk about later. But let's get back to, to him if if you can give a little bit of his story and sure. uh, that'd be yeah. great. Essentially yeah, because um uh, you know, they tried the same thing with him. They tried to throw him in prison as well, and he, he beat them right. in two federal trials. But I'll go back to the sort of the beginning. Mm-hmm. Sure. He, after he graduated first in his class from medical school, and while he was trying to, while he was completing his PhD in biochemistry, he just miraculously found a strain of peptides in human blood, and also found them in human urine that had never mm-hmm. been recorded before. It really had no idea what it meant, and but of course he, like any diligent scientist would, he followed mm-hmm. through on it. And um, as he kept testing these peptide levels in different people and different races and sexes and what have you, he found out that people with cancer seem to have a really low count of these peptides or in some cases mm-hmm. are almost completely lacking them. So he just sort of hypothesized, you know, wow, maybe if I can find out how to extract these peptides from healthy donors, mm-hmm. from their plasma or their urine, um, and give it to people with cancer, you know, maybe it would be helpful. That's all, you know, right. he sort of was going on. Very and, simple. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and right around this time, the Communist Party was putting a lot of pressure on him to join the Communist Party in Poland. And because he was such a successful, um, you know, he, his, um, mm-hmm. when he was first in his class and the peptide discovery, all this stuff sort of made headlines in mm-hmm. Poland. And um, so and he refused. He did not want to be a part of that. And they kept mm-hmm. um, drafting him into the military over and over again as oh, sort of no. punishment. <laughs> yeah. and, and by the second time he was drafted... He realized he was surrounded by other scientists who were in the same boat as him. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, ironically, he flees Poland to escape uh-huh. tyr- to escape tyranny, to come to the mm-hmm. land of the free, <laughs> to right. of course face something so much worse. But yeah, so he <clears throat> King was you know with twenty dollars in his pocket and his briefcase oh, with no. his peptide My studies. Goodness. Yeah, he you know gets a he goes to the Bronx, lives with his uncle, spent half his money on cab fare to get to the Bronx, you know, mm-hmm. and um, quickly got a job at Baylor College in Texas teaching mm-hmm. medicine and um, um, and then also because um, they also realized his peptide discovery, they were giving him a lot of free time to study this, and he even managed mm-hmm. to get money from our very own National Cancer Institute at this time, um, really? yeah, grant money to study the peptides. So then he, once they realized quickly how um, successful it was that um, the NCI and Baylor College sort of wanted to bring him in the fray and bring him into the sort of establishment um, mm-hmm. to con- further it. However, he was going to lose control over it, and um, he mm-hmm. would just basically be an employee working on his discovery. Right. And that wasn't something he was willing to risk because anything could have happened. They could have changed it, weakened it, yeah. shelved it, and, and any number but of things. He must have an incredible character to have gone through all of this and remain so strong. That's the thing I kept thinking. My goodness. Right. And it's funny. Uh, I get that question in a lot of the Q&A. Yeah. What, I, what I found is um, he sort of realizes, which I think is a, is a very important thing to realize, is that he knows that every scientific discovery throughout humanity that has been a paradigm-shifting scientific discovery mm-hmm. has been met with gigantic resistance. And he just, he just knows that. And he knows that yeah. he just happens to be one of those guys that – Right. Um, is one of those you know made one of those discoveries and he and he just, so he's aware of that and, mm-hmm. and he doesn't let it sort of get to him too badly because he just he understands this is just the fight he has just to the fight. The reality, because, yeah, exactly. He, like a good example is you know you look mm-hmm. at some of the things that Louis Pasteur um, discovered and mm-hmm. and in his time there wasn't this multi-trillion-dollar sort of a cartel running mm-hmm. this industry. It was very free and open back then, somewhat. And so you just it was easy to introduce it into the public. Versus today you have all these all this bureaucratic red tape to introduce right. anything into the public. So you have a a double, you know, you have double challenge. You have um, breaking the scientific sort of religious belief systems and allowing people to realize this is a mm-hmm. reality, and then you have the industry that has a lot to lose from allowing your uh, discovery to move forward. Right. <laughs> so, anyway, so anyway, so once he, what's really exciting is that he got one lucky break essentially after another. He once he once he realized that even the establishment recognized that it worked. Um, he said, okay, I want to figure out how to uh, treat cancer patients without getting in mm-hmm. any sort of trouble and without right. dealing. And he also, you know, he tried to apply uh, for clinical trials through the Food and Drug mm-hmm. Administration, repeatedly was denied permission to do so. So mm-hmm. he hired a legal team 
and they look through, uh, in, in the Texas law, you look, they look through the law and realize that Texas sort of being, at least at the time, the law has since been changed, but being the renegade state that it mm-hmm. um, sort of always has been, based on Texas law, if you are an individual scientist making, make, with your own individual discovery, treating mm-hmm. your own patients in your own clinic, um, especially in the case of patients that have exhausted all other mainstream treatments and there's right. simply nothing else that can be done. And as long as you, and you can do that, as long as your medicine doesn't leave the state of Texas, and then if mm-hmm. it does do that, it goes, it gets into federal territory and he right. would be breaking the federal law. Right. So just a wonderful lucky break. And he even alerted the federal government and the state government, mm-hmm. everything by the book said, this is what I'm going to be doing, guys. Right. <laughs> and they all just said, okay, what can we do? Because there's simply no law saying you can't do it. So he right. got his first cure in, in 1977, that long ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is someone that, um, and, and many, he cured many more around this time, but every one of these people, if you have to imagine that they exhausted everything. They were at mm-hmm. death's door. And, um, and Brzezinski was, no one knew who he was. And think about the sort of risk they must have been taken, taking, or, or the sort of despair, despair, the state of disparity they must have been in to go to some Polish guy they'd never heard of, just be treated by cancer, yeah. and then to be cured. <laughs> And um, so as soon as that started happening is when the then the the resistance really began. Right. And and he, and at the same time he began more became more and more popular. In 1983 he was on Sally Jesse Raphael's talk show mm-hmm. with his patients. In 1986 Oprah's first year on the air he was on her show with patients. Mm-hmm. And as this, as he got more popular, um, you know, the resistance um, kept pushing. So. You, on the state level, they went in and tried to take away his license under the, the under the idea that right. he's practicing quackery and it doesn't work. And he showed that it worked. He gave he jumped through every hoop they asked him to do, mm-hmm. and they still ignored the positive results. They ignored petitions, like sixty petitions from mm-hmm. um, patients, patients saying, yeah. "Please leave my doctor alone." They ignored all of that. Took him to trial numerous times. Went all the way to the state supreme court, and he still came out clean. They even had one of the um, this, one of the founders, of, the founder of the neuroradiology mm-hmm. section of the National Cancer Institute, who focuses only on brain cancer and um, for our own National Cancer Institute, took time off of his own job and put his own job on the line to fly to Texas and testify mm-hmm. on Brzezinski's behalf in court, saying he's never seen brain cancer cures like this in his in his life. It doesn't happen. This is miraculous, etc. So he had, and there's just you know he had everything going for him. Then on the federal level. They are trying to, of course, accuse him for shipping the medicine across state lines. And they have one grand jury after mm-hmm. another after another, um, all ending in no indictment. And to the point right. where congressional hearings were called, patients were yelling and screaming in Congress. Mm-hmm. And um, then they, of course, finally got an indictment. And, of course, he was uh, freed by two sets of jurors that he was, you know, completely, mm-hmm. uh, you know, done. He broke no laws. He was doing nothing wrong. And they even tried to hide from the jury. The, whether or not the treatment even worked, so they, yeah. they tried everything. Um, I, mean, they, I, they I want to, I want to make, I want to read this quote that you have on your your um, title page. Mm-hmm. Um, it constitutes nothing less than one of the worst abuses of the criminal justice system I've ever witnessed. Congressman Richard Burr, Republican, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's now a senator in North Carolina. Yep. So you know that's our own um, congressional uh, inquiry. Uh, branch, the the branch that's supposed to keep some balance of power <laughs> in place. <laughs> right. And it, it, it makes you realize, yeah, it makes you realize how powerful the industry is because even if the majority of Washington knows this treatment is, exists and knows it's real, mm-hmm. including the White House, by the way, David Axelrod, Obama's senior advisor, has seen this mm-hmm. film. He saw it back in November. And mm-hmm. he's because he's uh, good friends with um, the person who's in charge of Brzezinski's raising Brzezinski's money for his phase mm-hmm. three clinical trials. That's been very challenging. So he met. Well, about, how much money? Are, how much money are we talking about? Just to we're give talking about an idea. 150 million dollars. To yeah, continue. I think that's important for people to understand. Yeah. I don't know if anybody has ever been able to do this as a private a private person. No, it hasn't been done. I don't done. think they have. No, no. no. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think that's a very important point. Who has 150 million dollars laying around? Well, you know, you think that, like, you know, yeah, there's the Gates Foundation, there's all, and Bloomberg, there's all kinds of people that can write a check mm-hmm. tomorrow, um, or at least get the people together to do so, um, considering it would be just one big charitable tax write-off mm-hmm. anyway. Right. Um, but, you know, it's um, he's had numerous people step up to the plate and want to do it, and then for some unknown reason, they just disappear. It just dissolves, and they mm-hmm. don't really have much of an explanation as to why they've changed their mind. 
And a really a good example of this is um, Jeff Kindler, the CEO of Pfizer, called up Brzezinski mm-hmm. last December, said, I'm aware that you've been given permission to start phase three trials. Let's talk soon about partnering with you and mm-hmm. making and selling the drug once it's approved. Everyone right. was very excited. That maybe the mm-hmm. tide's turning. And of course, he never called back or returned any phone mm-hmm. calls. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, just, you know, clearly. So the way I see it is, once this thing is approved, if it is at all, which I'm hopeful that it can be, if, and mm-hmm. the only way it's going to be approved is if like my film hopefully will help, is if the, the awareness has been made. If people are right. aware of, what, of, the, of, the, of the status of this and they get the majority of the public understanding this and get the majority of the public standing up, the, the politicians are going to have no choice. It's going to just, just mm-hmm. like what happened to him in the 90s when the politicians stood up to try to keep him out of prison um, and the patients stood up saying, you know, yelling and screaming, saying, he's, you know, he's cured my cancer, cured my child's cancer. Why are you trying to take the, the treatment away? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and that kind of needs to happen again. And I'm hoping the film yeah. can be helpful. But the way I see it is if, it, if it's released to the market and um, people think that they're just out there to, I don't know, just hide the cure for cancer. It's, it's not so simple. If, if you have a, a, tr- a patented drug like this released to the market, any, even if you did partner with Pfizer and it's mm-hmm. released to the market, that, that entity has a seven-year exclusive license to make and sell it mm-hmm. So before it becomes generic. So what is going to happen to Bristol-Myers Squibb and Amgen and Johnson & Johnson and all of the mm-hmm. other guys when this thing hits the market and one entity has an exclusive license to make and sell what is essentially the biggest cancer breakthrough that has gone through the system correctly and hit the market and nobody else can have it but that entity. And who's going to go get chemo for lung cancer when he's got, you know, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's going to be devastating financially. <laughs> and this is, it's important to emphasize, this is a non-toxic treatment. Right. Non-toxic. And probably yeah. not that expensive compared well, yeah. to, you know, other treatments. That, yeah, absolutely not as expensive compared to other treatments because, um, Usually, if it does work, you're going to know it's going to work within the first 30 days or so because it right. doesn't work for everyone because it affects right. the genes and it needs more mm-hmm. time to develop it to cover a wider yeah. array of it needs patients. Research and development, right? And that's where the big money needs to come in. I mean, right. these, these these big pharmaceutical companies need to get their people and and get labs going to to because um, he's done a lot of work with. Um, changing it since he discovered it, or especially for different cancers. So, right, because you know, he, he doesn't extract it. It's an ongoing process, like, any, like anything. <laughs> Absolutely. He doesn't extract it. It's one thing that people get confused by is um, he does not extract it from blood and urine anymore. He, he does mm-hmm. a patent on the synthesizing them from scratch. Um, right. So basically it's, it allows your body to help create these peptides again ba- mm-hmm. by basically giving you the right chemicals to make your body do so, essentially, is what's going on. So... Yeah, I mean, you'd think. And um, I just found out, this is really exciting, a former uh, an NIH employee who worked on Brzezinski's uh, a, a treatment and studied it, and he was hired to mm-hmm. study it, a government employee, um, he um, you know, filed all sorts of positive reports for it. And, um, mm-hmm. and eventually, if you notice in the film, if you remember in the film, the NCI trials that were botched and rigged to fail, right. he was close to right. those. He was also working mm-hmm. with Dr. Devort Samiz in her lab, one of the persons um, who worked with the government to help file duplicate patents of this substance. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. yeah. It's a whole other you know, realm. But um, I'm hoping to talk to him really soon, and um, maybe he'll step forward and uh, go on camera. But yeah, but it's just a good example of showing how um, he, he left the, the NIH because of this exact type of corruption, and he moved right. back to China where he's from. He's studying different things there. But it, it's interesting. It's one of form, Brzezinski's former colleagues apparently is in China now, and he it pu- pulled out uh, an ex- extract from the urine originally, and it completed phase three trials in China. So it's essentially the same treatment being done over there, um, um, but based, based only on the blood and urine, which is interesting as well. Anyway, mm-hmm. so um, well, let's go back a little bit and talk about what happened um, with the uh, uh, tr- specifically what happened when um, the Natural Can- Cancer Institute did those trials um, uh, in, you know, supposedly to prove that his stuff didn't work. In 1991, the mm-hmm. National Cancer Institute sent down, I guess, a half a dozen or so scientists, other mm-hmm. like, top cancer specialists, including uh, Dr. Nicholas Patronis, who I mentioned earlier, who testified on Brzezinski's, in Brzezinski's defense in court. They went in there, they studied his uh, uh, files, studied his records, studied the methods, uh, met the patients, and, and, and verified for themselves it, it was indeed working. He was curing glioblastoma, right. you know, really deadly brain cancers. Yeah, things and, um, that people don't have much time when they get them. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, have, I show in the film all the internal documentation that they had that was internally uh, passed around in documenting all mm-hmm. of this, including the actual records they reviewed, all of it. So right after that happened, 
Um, it's sort of it's such a such a an overlapping kind of a collusion. I'll try to make it as simple as I can. Mm-hmm. Right right before this happened, he did have some interest um, before 1991. Before the visit, he did have some interest from um, the pharmaceutical industry, and uh, there was a Japanese company and an Italian company both wanting to move forward with it and partner with him. But mm-hmm. in their own documentation, they said, "Sorry, we have to pull out of this. It's clear the FDA is not going to cooperate with us. You know, mm-hmm. you know that's why why go forward? It's just going to be a waste of our mm-hmm. time and money." Right. However, Brzezinski treated the CEO's sister-in-law of cancer with can- of cancer and um, of, of a company called Elan Pharmaceutical, and mm-hmm. um, so so um, everything seemed like it was going great. And Brzezinski had assigned one of his scientists to Elan. Uh, to, to work with them. So this mm-hmm. is right before 91. And um, so I'm going to – I'll give the big uh, punchline at the end of this, of this little Okay. Bit. Um, <laughs> so basically – so all right. So it, so just keep that in mind. You know, the audience keep – remember what I just said about Elon and one of his scientists. Um, so, okay, the National Cancer Institute went in. They pr- verified that it worked. Then they said, okay, this is, this is grounds to begin government-sponsored clinical trials. Let's do it. Um, it makes sense to us, and uh, we're going to sponsor it, and we're going to run it, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then, um, so what happens? Elon realizes um, that one of the substances in one of his medicines is a pretty common substance, and Brzezinski mm-hmm. never patented it. And didn't, he was advised he shouldn't even bother trying to because it was just, it was just very common. And, but right. this substance was, it was, it was inert on its own. It was crucial to be mm-hmm. used with another proprietary substance that he had. So, right. so, what, so Elon just looked at this one substance and said, you don't have a patent on that. We're backing out. And, then, mm-hmm. and by this time, they had become really close to his own scientist that I mentioned mm-hmm. um, in developing this drug. So she dis- the scientist mm-hmm. disappears and runs off with Elon and partners with the National Cancer Institute. To t- they decide to test the single substance. So what happens is they push Brzezinski's initial trials they agreed upon. They, they push that into the back burner and just basically put it on hold mm-hmm. and to go forward without Brzezinski testing this individual substance. Brzezinski showed them the data and warned them, saying, look, the substance doesn't work. work. <laughs> like, I proved it 12 years ago. Right. It doesn't yeah. work. And right. they spent some $20 million and four years of research testing mm-hmm. it. And, and they even tested it on people. These poor people were hopeful that this treatment would help them. Yeah. And, they're, you know, and they got nowhere. And so, and of course, as the test failed, they finally go, okay, we'll, we'll do your clinical trials. And right out of the gate, they wanted to change his protocol, change mm-hmm. the schedules, and change the, based on 20 years of his experience, te- you know, treating right. people, getting it as, as perfect as he could at the time. They mm-hmm. they come in and wanting to change it all. So he said, No, I'm not letting you change it. Um, we're not. I'm not going to even give you my medicine as you agree to you know do it mm-hmm. the way I've been doing it. So they finally agree on paper, and he sends off his medicine. And of course, they change the whole thing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> without him, so he finds out about it, and he's and it's on the news even. Um, mm-hmm. You know, mainstream news. He's, he's, you know, they interview yeah. the doctors, and of course, they're saying that it's it's Brzezinski's fault. He's not cooperating with us, and Brzezinski's right. saying no, they're not cooperating with me. They signed off on the protocols, and they're intentionally right. breaking them. And this is very dangerous. It's very bad for the patients, obviously. Yeah. So. Anyway, so and it got even worse. Um, and I have all, and I show in the film all the mm-hmm. back and forth letters between the National yeah, Cancer Institute and particularly uh, Dr. Michael Friedman, uh, and uh, who's mm-hmm. a huge cancer researcher, and he's now the CEO of the City of Hope Cancer Hospital in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so he all is back and forth between Brzezinski and Michael Friedman. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. And um, and it got to the point where Friedman just shuts Brzezinski out of the trials altogether. So he mm-hmm. has no idea what's going on. And he threatens legal action to shut the trials down and um, basically did eventually force them to stop the trials because he realized mm-hmm. they're letting in patients that did not fit the criteria and they're they're changing the dosage levels and, and everything else. And what's so amazing is that it just goes to show how, how arrogant these guys are and, um, and the thinking that they just they are unbeatable and they're untouchable. It was mm-hmm. they. The NCI stated and gave it a, in a public press release that the, since the trials were halted prematurely, they were basically worthless and they are they're, they're scientifically mm-hmm. invalid. They, there's no way to justify um, saying here here or there if they're if what mm-hmm. what antineoplasms are capable of doing. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So then after he. Uh, defeats the state government, defeats the federal government, um, and calls them out on their own, um, you know, um, you know, carelessness and their own maliciousness, frankly, on their clinical trials. Mm-hmm. Four years later, the NCI decides to simply vindictively publish these in the peer-reviewed literature these exact mm-hmm. trials that they said four years earlier were invalid. And mm-hmm. they not only do they do it, 
and they say that the treatment doesn't work and all patients mm-hmm. died, they were careless enough to include in the in the data, in the report, the blood levels of the antineoplastin levels in all Which the patients. high enough. <laughs> and they were, yeah, it was all, it was like, they were literally diluting yeah. the medicine. And mm-hmm. in his strongest medicine, uh, antineoplastin A10, it was like 170 times lower um, mm-hmm. in the blood levels found in the system. And on top yeah. of that, Brzezinski had been warned by other patients, patients' relatives, mm-hmm. that they're diluting the medicine. We're, we're, we're watching it. Right, happen. Right. And, but there's no way to prove that. It's just one person saying that. Mm-hmm. But here's the proof. It's their own clinical trial data, their own right. blood level data, and uh, showing how, how they did it. And, and on top of that, you know, what also alerted Brzezinski was mm-hmm. all of the patients were suffering from really bad fluid retention, um, mm-hmm. having all this excess fluid in their system. And he didn't really make any sense because one of the only side effects of Brzezinski's treatment, which uh, is it's basically the only one, he has to use sodium to deliver the medicine into the system. Mm-hmm. This is what he chose as sort of like the carrier. And because right. of that, it, it creates massive dehydration in the system. And yeah. some of the patients I interviewed and talked about having to drink like three gallons a day, even young children, yeah. uh, right. three gallons a day of water. And like they said, you know, sometimes they couldn't make it to the bathroom fast enough <laughs> yeah. to, to, to urinate because it was so much water going into them. Mm-hmm. So everything contradicted everything. Like it, it causes dehydration, not fluid retention. And right. It was just amazing. So, Anyway, so once those were, anyway, yeah, so that's, that's essentially what happened there. And you, you only have to sort of come to the conclusion on your own, your own conclusion, why did they do it? Why did they rig it? Do they want to show the world that it didn't well, work? I don't think it, I don't think it was because they're stupid. I think it's, I think it's intentional. Right. I, mean, it was, I think it's obvious it's intentional because if they were just being stupid, it wouldn't have been published later. Right, that's correct. Now they and, were stupid because the evidence was in the publication and, and they obviously overlooked that, but, yeah, I, I think it's just pure and simple that the government agencies from the FDA on, including all of, all of the agencies that are involved here, basically are controlled by Big Pharma. That's correct. I mean, the, Big Pharma has completely usurped um, mm. the, the Drug Evaluation Department and most of yeah. the most of the yeah. government agencies because they have to in order to, to survive right. in this system. You have no choice. You have to because they are the gatekeepers, and if you want to mm-hmm. keep your stock going up, you have to overrun them. And it's just it's just economics 101. It's just it goes happens every day. No different than how the oil companies have, especially back in the the Bush years, they were mm-hmm. just you know they were just running rampant, you know, doing whatever the heck they wanted to do, including going into Iraq and killing a million people to get more oil. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. did you see did you see this week's Time magazine? I have not. It's uh you you want to get a copy the the cover well not the cover story but one of the stories inside is is the FDA on drugs. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it really is. But I I wrote a book called The Naked Truth About Breast Implants and mm-hmm. as you as you may have known eight uh, FDA research scientists turned the F, blew the whistle on the FDA I think it was in the New York Times saying that science was uh, ignored in politics. Uh, uh, followed in these following things, and of course, breast implants were part of it. Um, yep. When they reapproved silicone breast implants in 2006, on the FDA's website was a study, partially paid for by the FDA, that ruptured silicone implants are associated with high levels of fibromyalgia, mm-hmm. which is a chemical toxicity. So you're, you're talking um, about the yeah, you're talking <laughs> you about know? the letter yeah. You're talking about the letter that nine scientists wrote to Obama's Nine transition. scientists. Yeah. Yeah. I have that letter, actually, the actual letter. Yep, it's on Good. my website. Good. Um, under well, the, I was really yeah. happy that they turned the FDA in because I didn't want to have to. Right. <laughs> in my book. I, just, I just quoted them. It was real easy. Right. I, mean, I, think I didn't exactly. have to go after the FDA. It was like, right. well, <laughs> their own people did it. Exactly. And it goes to show, again, how powerful <laughs> they are because it was hand, this letter was given to our own president's transition team leader. And mm-hmm. in the first sentence, it said, it is fundamentally broken, failing to fulfill its mission, and yeah. nothing has been done to address this. And, and you have to infer that the only reason that is, is, is bigger than the White House. This is bigger than what the president oh, I think. I, I, think it's big, I think it's bigger than our nation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think this is worldwide, and, and I think that um, until I call them the powers that be, and, and we don't know exactly how they're organized, but there are some theories, mm-hmm. um, until the powers that be loosen their stranglehold on uh, institutions, um, and uh, and I guess the the people can can actually get some uh, justice in the justice system and and uh, intelligent laws in the legislative area and, and intelligent decisions in the executive branch. You know, I, I think it's business as usual. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, why 
why is a politician given permission to mm. make decisions about science? <laughs> you know, exactly. They, they they're not scientists, so why are they yeah. interfering with it? Um, so it's it's the whole system is completely broken. It's just really sad. Yeah. Yeah. I want to before we get too far. I want to uh, sure. sort of give like the big icing on the cake earlier about the yeah. NCI trials and everything. Right. So if you remember, you know, Alon, one of his scientists, botched trials. Um, published. Mm-hmm. He defeated everybody. So what was going on? And I didn't know this until and most of all of this I didn't really know until I met Brzezinski and I really learned all of it. I just wanted to talk mm-hmm. about medicine, talk about some of the struggles. I didn't right. realize how deep it went. So oh, yeah. what was happening was, if, you, if I mentioned when I mentioned earlier in 1991, it was in October 1991 when the NCI visited this clinic. What he didn't know then, but he found out later, and I have in the film, is 17 days after they left his clinic, they filed their first patent, mm-hmm. <laughs> a duplicate patent, using one of his Brzezinski's own scientists right. um, on, the, on one of his medicines. And um, they filed 11 of them, yep. and they kept, make, they kept filing them. And um, again, it, it, was, mm-hmm. it was assigned to the United States Department of Health and Human Services, with the inventor being one of Brzezinski's own scientists. And in mm-hmm. the patents is Elan Pharmaceuticals. They were included. Um, it, so it, it was a clear indication that they were trying to steal it. So mm-hmm. the same government agency that was trying to throw him in prison, mm-hmm. trying to tell the world that it doesn't work, and, tr- and rigging his trials, um, mm-hmm. they were also going behind his back, patenting the very same medicine that, was in, this, that, that all this was involved in. So, yep. And um, what's interesting is once the 11th patent was filed, and um, – and we talk about everybody knows about the revolving door between the, the government agencies and pharma, especially. And right. you know, when you have drug evaluation people from pharmaceutical industry working for the FDA, that's a big problem. So in mm-hmm. this case, um, I have no proof of of him his involvement really, but it's just an interesting mm-hmm. coincidence. But Michael Friedman, the same man who led the NCI trials that were rigged and uh, botched, and, and um, you know, um, and the, the medicine was diluted and everything. You know, he was like this guy's like friends with Bill Clinton. He was appointed by Clinton. He's a big, big player mm-hmm. in the cancer world. He leaves his position at the NCI and becomes deputy commissioner of operations for the Food and Drug Administration, working directly under the commissioner. And only a couple of months after he moves is when the uh, the FDA magically gets their first indictment on him. After, mm-hmm. and this is after the patents were filed, and <laughs> it's just fascinating to see the timeline sort of come together. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, yeah, it's just very interesting. And, so yeah, I just I mean it just re- it just shows how real the treatment is, and it shows you how powerful um, and how, how much of a threat it is to the establishment if this thing got out. So let's let's go back and give our audience a little bit of an idea of how much big pharma makes on cancer treatments. Do you have that uh, an estimate of that? Yeah, I mean um, it's. I mean it's, it's or essentially one drug or, or well yeah for instance um, Avastin. It's mm-hmm. a gene-targeted drug, um, just like Brzezinski's, except it's not nearly as uh, effective, um, mm-hmm. and it also has a, a lot of very damaging side effects. To be mm-hmm. on that drug, and only that drug, is a, about $100,000 a year as they make on that mm-hmm. individual patient on that taking that individual drug. And, right. of course, um, the insurance companies will cover that. Um, you know, it's great. So then you compare that to, say, um, someone, like a, a one patient I interviewed that had colon cancer, um, he was uh, cured in four and a half, well, cancer-free in four and a half months, and then of course mm-hmm. the cure rate. You have to be cured uh, based on five-year survival. You know, he yes. spent forty grand to be to be cured of cancer in four, mm-hmm. you know, in four and a half months. You compare that if he was taking, say, a vaccine, if they felt like he should be on that, he, first of all, wouldn't have been cured. Uh, he would have just mm-hmm. been on it for years until he died. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's cancer treatment is a cash cow, and especially when you think about things like radiation treatment for inoperable brain tumors like glioblastoma, you're mm-hmm. looking at like a sixty-plus thousand dollar medical bill for a course of radiation um, that the insurance company pays, and they know the patient's going to die because they have no scientific mm-hmm. data to support that anyone has ever lived through that type of cancer. Mm-hmm. It's very fascinating. And then when the same exact cancer has been treated by Brzezinski, and there are there is data, the, the mm-hmm. own government's data showing that the stats, showing how his treatment is effective with glioblastoma versus chemo and radiation. It's you know it's the difference is night and day. So yeah, I mean it's a it's a, it's a, the pharmaceutical industry itself is the second most profitable industry uh, pretty much on the globe, and um and, and it was is that one, is that after the chemical industry? It's it's after oil. Yeah. Oil, okay. And it, 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 it was a time in the 90s where it was more profitable than oil. And then once, um, mm-hmm. uh, once the, um, yeah, but basically after 9-11 and, and the invasion of Iraq and the oil prices jumped is when mm-hmm. oil surpassed the okay. pharmaceutical industry. Dr. Marsha Angel, the former editor-in-chief mm-hmm. of the New England Journal of Medicine, has, she has a great book. I think it's called The, the Truth About Drug Companies, I believe. And mm-hmm. it, she's done all this research um, on how much money they spend, where the money's allocated. What's fascinating is that 
uh, I don't remember the, I think it's like 87, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get the numbers exactly right, but mm-hmm. I think it was like 87 billion, uh, collectively, is what the pharmaceutical industry spends every year on, for, on everything, research and development, advertising mm-hmm. and everything. And she found out that basically 35 billion mm-hmm. of this is unaccounted for. They, she's not able, no one, they're not able to f- account for it. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, um, and it's also interesting is that people think the pharmaceutical industry spends all this money on research and development. They do, mm-hmm. of course, but it's, it's the smallest portion of what they spend money on. Mm-hmm. It's like $17 billion. Um, and it's like, you know, while advertising is like 35. But this other 35, mysterious 35, um, Dr. Angel uh, has, has sort of um, come, to come up with a theory that that's where your ghostwriting money and all that stuff comes mm-hmm. in. Because they don't, you know, when they hire doctors to write articles that put in peer-reviewed mm-hmm. literature, like, like, the, like, like what happened with Vioxx, they hire right. a bunch of doctors to create fake data, imaginary mm-hmm. patients, says Vioxx works, they get paid off really well, they get published mm-hmm. in the peer-reviewed journals, you know, as, as you know, the gospel, as a, that it's fine. And when in reality, they knew it was a it was a dangerous, terrible drug, and everybody was going to profit off of it. And even if they get sued, which they did, they still come out ahead financially. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and you can you can have a class action lawsuit uh, for some four billion dollars, and pharma, pharma still makes a profit. It doesn't matter um, right. most of the time. Right. So it's interesting. Um, yeah. So it, uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a very very corrupt, powerful <laughs> entity that. It makes a fortune, and so uh, you know they send you know they've just got the doctors in the palm of their hands as well. You know some of these oncologists um, they won't go on camera, but they're like, yeah, you know a board certified oncologist can make a quarter of a million dollars a year, but he'll make another additional million um, in chemotherapy uh, commission. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So right. It's, they just they've got a stranglehold. So they don't, on it. Yeah, they they don't want to change either for something that that isn't uh, profitable to them. Yeah, it's hard. Um, you know, it's it's hard for somebody to give all that up. You know, mm-hmm. that give that lifestyle up. And um, yeah. <laughs> so what what do you foresee? Uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier that um, you know people have to start speaking up, um, especially through their uh, representatives mm-hmm. in Congress. Um, but how do we make our way out of this mess? I think the step one is people have to know about it, and um, and I think. Um, there's like, and I think like there's a couple of levels of way to go about it. I think the first is like try to get some celebrity involvement because they have so much power to like right. get the ear of, of people. Mm-hmm. And like yeah. Michael Douglas was recently diagnosed with throat cancer, mm. and we've been trying to get a copy to him. And I'm uh, we're going through his agency and um, mm-hmm. another documentary filmmaker that had him as his uh, narrator. I'm going through him as well. Try to get right. him copies. And you know, all we need is one Michael Douglas to go to Brzezinski, be mm-hmm. cured, go back on Letterman, and tell the world. <laughs> You know, right. it's going to cause a lot of. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to cause huge waves, and yeah. also, I mean, what I I would not be surprised at all if once people knew about it and they realize, like, say, some glioblastoma patients understand that they're going to die, and the only chance they have, of course, if it's inoperable, and the only chance they have is is Brzezinski, that mm-hmm. you're going to start seeing some protests. You're going to start seeing people, you know, standing up and saying, "No, I refuse all treatment unless you give me this." And mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, you know, start making a lot of noise about this, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. I mean, I just want to, you know, like to see things like that begin to happen. I mean, we do need to. Um, I don't know. Unfortunately, we have to be at the mercy of the politicians, and the only way right. they're going to listen is if they have a majority and they and they, thre- they they threaten they and we, we threaten them with something they can lose unless they lean this direction. That's the only way I can see it. Um, also, what's exciting is that Japan, fortunately, has been very mm-hmm. supportive of the of anti neoplastons. They have um, just completed their first phase three trial for colon cancer. Phase mm-hmm. three is the final phase before approval, and of course, the results were like two, two, three times plus the survival rate of mainstream treatment Mm -hmm. on colon cancer. And unlike the United States, the Japanese government and the Japanese medical establishment is very supportive. They're not interfering or trying to suppress it. Uh, Japan just has a little bit more freedom. uh, They give more freedom to physicians. Even the Gerson Mm -hmm. therapy is being used over there in in a a mainstream level. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's exciting. So what that means is it's probably going to be approved in Japan before here. So they're going to mm-hmm. sort of be the trailblazers, set the precedent. We're going to have people flying to Japan to be treated, you know, Absolutely. legally. And, um, and then maybe that will help the push the move. But, um, again, I, it's so hard to imagine allowing one company to have the rights to make and sell it. It's going to just destroy the rest of the industry. You would mm-hmm. think that CEOs uh, of Pfizer and, and so on – or would be smart enough to realize that they could, if, if, they, if this truly is a capitalist system, and that's what, and it's about the competition, they have an opportunity to completely mm-hmm. destroy their competitors. With by, yeah, by, but l- by, let me tell you something. Yeah. Unless they don't have a family, mm-hmm. unless they have incredible security, mm-hmm. they will be encouraged not to make that decision. 
That's right. And that's the it, level of the threat that will be made. Absolutely. And um, that's, I think that's why Pfizer uh, backed out um, after their oh, phone yeah, call. Oh, yeah, death threats, I'm sure. Or, or in, you know, implied threats. You know, I, I talked to a, a former lobbyist for Roche Pharmaceutical who's retired mm-hmm. just last week. Mm-hmm. And um, his son had seen the film and he emailed me and said, my dad is a retired Roche lobbyist and he loved, you, know, you got to talk to him. That's mm-hmm. fine. And I talked to him on the phone. And I asked him, I said, so, and based on the seven-year exclusive license I mentioned and um, everything else, Mm-hmm. And I, I, I said, Did you, you know, why do you think it is that no pharmaceutical company will step up? Because I really don't know how to answer that question. You'd think they would. Mm-hmm. And he said, and it's so funny is these people are so close to it, they just can't believe it's possible. It's all, it's going back to the religious belief kind of dog, mm-hmm. dogmatic. He's like, he goes, he just says, there's no way that the pharma itself would ever stop something like this. It's a very competitive world, and they, if this is real, they're going to jump on it, and they would have jumped on it a long time ago, blah, 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 blah. But he, I mean, he believes it's real. He saw the film, but it's very interesting. So I said, I said to him, so, well, you know, pharma, from what I understand, is sort of like a big entity, kind of like how the Milk Council is for the milk industry. You, know, you have the Got mm-hmm. Milk campaign. They sort of represent the industry. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what pharma sort of is. They have their own board of directors, from what I understand, and that's what they do. They're sort of, they represent the whole industry. So mm-hmm. it would only make sense to me that maybe they're the ones stopping their own industry from letting this go forward. You know, you know what I mean? But again, mm-hmm. I, I have no proof of that, but it would make sense. Uh, I, would, I would assume that they would have to sort of consult with them on some level and uh, get sort of permission, but I don't have any proof of that. But and yeah. I, I really believe that there is something at a, at a higher level stopping it as well. I think, I think it's, it's um, something that is not interested in massive um, response to anything with cancer. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, yeah. we've got that. I mean, I, I think there are agendas beyond pharma that control pharma. Could be. Absolutely. And it's and so interesting. Th- that, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, it's so interesting that, like, you, mm-hmm. like as you know, it's not the first time this has happened. It's not an isolated incident. So, no, it isn't. Yeah. And, um, and you know, it's like, worldwide. It's mm-hmm. literally worldwide. It is not just in the U.S. either. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, what got me interested in this too. I talked about Ralph Moss. Is I thought it was so interesting that Laetril, um, you know, while it was never really a mm-hmm. cure, um, mm-hmm. but you know, the NCI tested it. Everybody tested it, and in in vitro mm-hmm. and in animals, it was a virtually ninety percent preventative of cancer, mm-hmm. uh, and then also a ninety percent stoppage of all metastasis. So right. it worked really well on the cellular level. Um, but again, mm-hmm. it was a food. It came out of came from certain foods. Couldn't patent mm-hmm. it. And um, Sloan Kettering's own leaders, according to Ralph and his data, um, went to the NCI and went to the Mm -hmm. FDA in two separate years begging and pleading to allow Mm -hmm. Leotrol to be tested on humans. And they Mm -hmm. they turned them down both times. So the leaders were put in a position where they were forced to lie about it. Mm-hmm. So they knew they were lying. And I watched uh, Daniel Ellsberg's um, mo- a documentary about him, uh, The Most Dangerous Man in the Room. Or, you know, back in the day, he worked for mm-hmm. the Pentagon, and he released all the internal documents and just blew the whistle on the lies of the Vietnam War. There's one mm-hmm. line in that film, I think he talked about McNamara, um, where he said, and, and he showed the clip of um, this guy lying, one of our head, uh, heads mm-hmm. of Washington, and um, they said, I, I hope I'm never in a position of power where I, ha- I am forced to lie like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and again, that's exactly what happened to Sloan Kettering. That's exactly what's happening with Brzezinski. Is, um, mm-hmm. it, these, these people are, are not allowed to tell you the truth <laughs> when it comes to things like this. So, yeah. Another but, interesting thing um, is, like, you know, if you think about it, every aspect of technology uh, – whether it be computers or automobiles or what mm-hmm. have you, it's just skyrocketed. And cancer mm-hmm. treatment has been stuck in the same position it's been in since the 40s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, it's fascinating. It's a, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, just another observation. Well, given that one in two men will get cancer and one in three women will get cancer, mm-hmm. and that statistic is actually increasing. And mm-hmm. if you talk about brain tumors, I predict that we'll have a whole rash of brain tumors from our electromagnetic um, situations uh, and, and how that affects neuroepithelial uh, malignancies. Doctor, I, I interviewed Dr. Carlo on, on this radio show. Mm-hmm. He did $20 million of research for the cellular phone industry, and when he found that cellular telephones really do cause um, uh, malignancies of the brain, including um, uh, uh, neuroblastomas and other, not neuroblastomas, but um, epithelial malignancies, as well as uh, benign tumors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he he, uh, he had to flee. for. Uh, they burned down his house and he had to flee. To Are flee. you serious? He burned down his house? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's what I was told. That's yeah, what I was well, told. 
Brzezinski um, By people refuses, close to him. He re- Brzezinski refuses to own a cell phone um, because mm-hmm. he read that kind of research. So that's yeah. also interesting. Um, so Well, there's yeah. other reasons for that, too. Directed energy can be brought through a cell phone. Right. So, um, but I think... Uh, I, I just admire the man's courage and his fortitude and stamina because this has got to be mentally challenging. You know, when you've got all these critically ill patients and you're working against the clock to help them and then you keep being uh, bothered by everybody and people trying to steal your your uh, discoveries. And it's just it's incredible. He must be an incredibly strong individual. He is. And, again, it goes, goes back to... Um he he knows he's right, and um, he knows that it's it's worth the fight. It's worth risking prison time to stand up for what mm-hmm. you realize is, a, is is real and what's better for the sake of humanity, frankly. And and again, going back to realizing how every scientist in history has been met with massive resistance when it comes to changing what is considered the standard. Right. And, um, and he just knows it. And a you know, good example, like I have in the film, is Ignaz Semmelweis, um, uh, an Hungarian doctor who was the first guy to realize that maybe it's a good idea as a physician to wash your hands <laughs> before delivering a baby or you know, going, undergoing any sort of surgical procedure at all, um, even though yep. delivering a baby is not really surgery unless it's a cesarean. But, and you know, he was kicked out of the profession for this observation mm-hmm. of just, hey, guys, wash your hands first. Um, you know, and, and so... And what? The doctors were coming in from the autopsy labs too. That's correct. It was, that was, that's how it that was a very bad thing. Yeah, they were. So they were actually bringing a lot of germs in. Yep, they were performing autopsies. Um, in some cases, on with people that have peripheral fever, and peripheral mm-hmm. fever was a really right. major cause of uh, death in women um, mm-hmm. during after childbirth. And so they had no gloves on, and they'd go right out of the basement of the autopsy room, right mm-hmm. upstairs with unwashed mm-hmm. hands, bare hands, right. and deliver kids, and the parents yeah. would die. And, of course, one of his colleagues got cut his finger accidentally during an autopsy, mm-hmm. came down with a per- symptom of peripheral fever, died, right. and that's why he said, oh, my gosh, maybe we're transferring the disease. <laughs> Wash your hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah, something so simple. <laughs> yeah. And what's important for people to realize is that was just the belief system. It had nothing mm-hmm. to do with money. Right. It, there was no, right. There's no thing to profit off of hand washing. No. You know? So it wasn't like a, you know, uh, a conspiracy for the, you know, the rubber glove mm-hmm. makers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> right. So, so it's massive. It's a massive hurdle because um, we have all these factors against mm-hmm. you. Yeah. Well, yeah. how do people get a hold of the the DVD? Can you give you your can, contact information? Sure, sure. Um, Brzezinski uh, movie. Br- BrzezinskiMovie dot com. There's the trailers. Uh, there's mm-hmm. an order form for DVD. It's also on Amazon. I'll spell it. It's B U R Z Y N S K I Movie dot com. And um, I've been moving a lot of DVDs. Um, there's a couple, mm-hmm. couple of major celebrities that are going to step up and endorse it. I don't want to say who they are, right. but that's that's one of them. One of the endorsements is going to happen next week. It should be really Great. interesting. Yeah. And they're going to right. do it on their, on their Twitter account um, with a, like, nearly two million people following this person. It's really going to be exciting. <laughs> oh, super! Uh, yeah, and then super. here's here's something else to remember before we go. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not going to tell you which one because I'm going to give them that much respect. But mm-hmm. one of the sure. major networks is going to have an uh, an hour special with Brzezinski and Dr. Gonzalez included. Uh, it's oh, going to be great! On, it's going to be on, a, and, and I'm included. They've been to my screenings. They they, they have the film. They've interviewed me on camera. They have all the documents that I have in that film. However, I mm-hmm. I don't believe they're going to do a very good job. I don't believe they're going to tell the truth. And in fact, one mm-hmm. of them even told me, I want to do the right thing, but I'm not sure if my bosses will allow me to do so. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. So, so you need to get something like the Discovery Channel or you know Discovery Health or or Link TV is good. Mm-hmm. You, you need to do something on one of the cable channels that is isn't influenced by the powers that be. Well, you're not going to believe this, but um, and I can't believe it myself, but one of these major networks, a major mm-hmm. network, that's it's cable, mm-hmm. but um, it's a it's a, a subsidiary of one of the major networks. They've mm-hmm. already I met with them at a two hour meeting with all their documentary mm-hmm. heads, and they said mm-hmm. they're they're willing to air the film if I have to, I have to make it shorter. Which is fine, and I have mm-hmm. to include um, some I, like some some like big fish. So I managed to get one guy from the NIH. I'm going to meet with him in D.C. in, in late mm-hmm. September, and another guy who um, uh, the, also works in the NIH. I'm going to try to get him in, and I'm trying to get a, a handful of more board certified oncologists in the film. And mm-hmm. they, they they swear that if I can get that in, it'll make it more airtight, at least in their opinion, and they'll consider mm-hmm. airing it. And the same is happening in, in England, uh, U.K. Uh, um, 
uh, rep has uh, found a network that will do it under the exact same conditions. So I'm going to have to spend my own money and time and redo the film just for the sake of television. And uh, so that's exciting. Um, and again, I, when, I, when I put the film together, I wanted to, to preach not to the choir. I wanted to, mm-hmm. to let the, the, both the layman and the scientist and, right. the, and the cancer uh, specialist where they could understand it. And I, I used right. their own rules um, to, to show them. I don't mm-hmm. show case histories or, or anecdotal right. stories. Right. I, yeah. I show the very same scientific data based on the scientific mm-hmm. method, the supposed method that they're taught to respect. And that's what I, that's right. how I, sh- I can present the information. And it's been really effective. And um, I think that's why major networks have been agreeing to maybe consider it. Yeah. Because it's hard to argue with it. It's like I'm playing hard by their science. rules. Hard but, but, science. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So. Yeah. Well, I I really wish you luck with this. I think it's an incredibly important, um, not just the information to get out, but this thing that we need to break, which is the resistance to um, cancer or any other uh, disease treatments that are effective being suppressed. Which, which I believe is done actively, um, in, especially in cancer, but is also being done in, in, in other uh, fields as well. And yeah. I, I think we need to, um, you know, like you say, step up and get the legislatures involved, get the, the first thing is education of, of the people who can make a difference, maybe some people who aren't afraid to donate money toward um, clinical trials uh, on, on these substances and, yeah. and and just get the awareness up. And it's just amazing to me that that um, this stuff has been suppressed so long. I mean, I think it's, it, it, it's, it really makes you wonder what is actually going on at the highest levels in the world. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, give your um, website one more time if you would spell it again for us. Sure. Uh, B U R Z Y N S K I movie Brzezinski movie dot com, and uh, I have a lot of clips on YouTube now. Where um, I have, uh, probably thirty percent of the film is chopped up uh, on YouTube and, and various clips as well. So yeah, I've uh, recommended a lot of people go look at your YouTube stuff. Well, this is Dr. Susan Cobb. We've been interviewing Eric, who is the, um, uh, I guess, the producer and director of uh, Brzezinski, the movie, and um, we'll be having some exciting new things, hopefully, on um, TV, as well as uh, has a bunch of stuff on YouTube. Please take a look at all of that, as well as um, take a look at his DVD. Next week, we will be interviewing Harold Kerning on chronic pain, and then Paul Redemaker, who is the head of the Monroe Institute, will be joining us again on the 18th. And we will be interviewing the author of Fatty Liver on the 25th. Um, Our noetic science meeting on Thursday, September 16th at 7.30 at the Dunwoody office. Dr. Brad Gould will be discussing electromagnetic fields, including the cell phone, computer, Wi-Fi, all of these, and what effect they have on your body, electromagnetic pollution. Again, thank you very much for joining us. This has been Temple of Health Radio Show.